Breaking news this morning, an earthquake of magnitude 6.1 kills over 900 people in Afghanistan. Several hundred were injured with the toll expected to grow as more information comes in. A jetliner caught fire after landing at Miami International Airport. The flight was arriving from Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. Trump endorsed Katie Britt wins Alabama's U.S. Senate primary runoff and we bring you the results from elections in Virginia and Georgia. South Dakota's Attorney General was convicted of impeachment charges and barred from office on Tuesday. Find out what led to his removal. And meet the 20-month-old boy who is brightening up Instagram and bringing a smile to people's faces. Good morning. Welcome to NTD Daybreak. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, June 22nd, and we have some breaking news this morning. Disaster management officials in Afghanistan say 950 people were killed early this morning in an earthquake of magnitude 6.1. More than 600 are reported injured, and the toll is expected to grow. Information is still trickling in from remote mountain villages. This quake was the deadliest since 2002. The U.S. Geological Survey says it struck about 27 miles from the southeastern city of Coast near the border with Pakistan. Mounting a rescue operation could be a major test for the Taliban who took over the country in August. They have been cut off from most international support because of sanctions. 119 million people in Afghanistan, Pakistan and India felt the shaking. There have been no immediate reports of damage or casualties in Pakistan. Afghanistan has asked humanitarian agencies to help with rescue efforts. And people at the Miami International Airport were holding their breaths yesterday evening. A jetliner carrying 126 people caught fire after landing at the airport. The front landing gear had collapsed. Luckily, there were no serious injuries. According to local media, the aircraft arriving from the Dominican Republic made an emergency landing at around 5.30 p.m. Passengers and crew members on board were evacuated. Reports indicate four people suffered minor injuries. Two runways at the airport were closed in the aftermath of the accident. The National Transportation Safety Board says a team will arrive at the airport to investigate the fire by Wednesday. The fire crews had the fire under control and were mitigating fuel spillage. The plane came to rest in grass beside a runway. Firefighters apparently doused the aircraft and the surrounding area with white chemicals. And now on to Tuesday's primary. Trump endorsed Katie Britt as the winner of Alabama's Senate primary runoff. We also have decisions from the primary in Virginia and the runoffs in Georgia. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg brings us more on the results. Trump endorsed Britt, defeated incumbent representative Mo Brooks in the GOP primary runoff for U.S. Senate on Tuesday. Brooks, who previously had Trump's backing, lost the former president's endorsement in March. Despite that, he still called himself Mega Mo during his campaign. Britt, a former chief of staff for the man she is running to succeed, retiring Republican Senator Richard Shelby, received Trump's endorsement this month. Britt tallied around 60% of the vote. In Georgia's Republican House primary runoffs, Mark Gonsalves beat Michael Corbin for the 7th District nomination with 70% of the vote, and Chris West defeated Jeremy Hunt in the 2nd District. Rich McCormick beat Trump-endorsed Jake Evans in the 6th District, and in the 10th District, Mike Collins was victorious over Trump-backed Vernon Jones. In Virginia, Republican State Senator and Navy veteran Jen Kiggins won the House GOP primary for District 2 and will face Democratic Representative Elaine Luria. Yesley Vega won the Republican primary for District 7 for the right to challenge incumbent Abigail Spanberger. Luria and Spanberger are seen as two of the most vulnerable Democrat House members in November's midterms. Due to Democratic President Joe Biden's low approval ratings, Republicans are favored to win control of the House. They only need to flip five Democratic seats to gain a majority and could also take control of the Senate. A Republican-controlled House could halt Biden's legislative agenda and launch investigations into his administration. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. South Dakota Attorney General Jason Ronsberg 
was convicted of two, of two impeachment charges yesterday. He is being removed from his position and barred from future office. The South Dakota Senate convicted him of committing a crime causing someone's death and found him guilty for allegedly misleading investigators and misusing his office. The charges stem from a fatal crash back in 2020 when a 55-year-old man was killed. On a 911 call after the crash, Ravensburg said he hit something that might have been a deer or other animal. He said he didn't know it was a man until the next morning after returning to the scene. Prosecuting attorneys focused on Ravensburg shifting his statements around, driving over the speed limit, browsing on his phone during his drive home and being in the middle of the road at the time of impact. Investigators also argued that the man's face could have come through the windshield because his glasses were found in the car. Votes to bar Ravensburg from future office were unanimous. He is the first official to be impeached and convicted in South Dakota history. Senate bargainers reached an agreement Tuesday on a bipartisan gun control bill. The bill comes in response to recent shootings in Texas and New York that shocked people nationwide. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says the bill could pass the Senate by the end of this week. I will now take the first steps to move this life-saving legislation on the Senate floor for a vote. With an initial procedural vote tonight, and following that, we will move to final passage as soon as possible. I expect the bill to pass the Senate by the week's end. The 80-page bill was released nine days after a framework plan was agreed on by lawmakers. The bill would toughen background checks for young gun buyers, increase penalties on gun traffickers, and provide funding to states and communities for improving school safety and mental health initiatives. It would also prohibit romantic partners who were convicted of domestic violence but not married to their victims from getting firearms. The initial procedural vote was 64 to 34, with 14 Republicans voting yes, along with all 48 Democrats and two allied independents. Passage by the Democratic-led House may soon follow. And in Texas, the latest in the Uvalde hearing, the director of the state's Department of Public Safety testified before the Texas Senate today. He said the Uvalde, Uvalde School District police chief chose to put the lives of officers ahead of the lives of children. And today's Jason Perry has a story. One error, 14 minutes and eight seconds. That's how long the children waited and the teachers waited in rooms 111 to be rescued. The director of the Texas Department of Public Safety, Colonel Steve McGraw, testified before the Texas Senate on the police response to the school shooting in Uvalde. And while they waited, the on scene commander waited for radio and rifles. Then he waited for shields. Then he waited for SWAT. Lastly, he waited for a key that was never needed. The only thing stopping a hallway of dedicated officers from entering room 111 and 112 was the on-scene commander, who decided to place the lives of officers before the lives of children. Parents of the victims and residents also blamed the on-scene commander, Pete Arredondo, when they spoke at Monday's school board meeting in Uvalde. I find it shameful that we had almost 100 officers on the scene and I had to leave work and save my own. We were failed by Pete Arredondo. He failed our kids, teachers, parents, and city. And by keeping him on your staff, y'all are continuing to fail us. How is Ms. Arredondo still with the program? Suspend them pending termination. It's an insult to injury. These people are in pain and you allow this to happen. Jose Flores Sr. lost his 10-year-old son in the shooting. I mean, the chief, they still have the chief and they haven't fired him. He's still in, he's still in the office. Something has to be done. Delays in the law enforcement response have been the focus of the investigations. We reached out to the Uvalde School District Police Department for comment, but we didn't hear back before airtime. Jason Perry, NTD News. The city mayor said on Tuesday that the elementary school will be demolished, though he did not specify when this would happen. President Joe Biden is pushing back against criticism about being overly harsh with energy companies. It comes at a time when gasoline prices near record highs. 
The chairman and CEO of Chevron contacted Biden Tuesday, saying the president has been vilifying oil producers and refiners as gas is averaging nearly $5 a gallon nationwide. Here's what Biden had to say. Look, we need more refining capacity. This idea that they don't have oil to drill and to bring up is simply not true. We ought to be able to work something out whereby they're able to increase refining capacity and still not give up on transitioning to renewable energy. They're both within realm of possibility. Today, President Biden is expected to call for the federal tax on gasoline to be temporarily suspended. Pausing the tax faces significant opposition in Congress from both sides of the aisle. Biden is also facing criticism from economists and companies that it would not increase supplies and lower prices. And over in Maine, the Supreme Court has struck down a state law that excludes families from a tuition assistance program if they choose to send their children to religious schools. Now, some students attending private religious schools in the state will qualify for taxpayer-funded tuition aid. Here are the details. The Supreme Court ruled on Thursday that if a state uses taxpayer money to pay for students attending non-religious private schools, it must also use taxpayer money to pay for students attending religious private schools. Under Maine's school system, the state pays for the tuition of some students attending private schools. This is to deal with the lack of public schools in many rural districts. But the policy only applies to private non-religious schools. Students attending private religious schools still have to pay out of pocket. Several parents in Maine filed a lawsuit challenging the policy. They argued that not allowing families to access public funding for schools based on religious values violates First Amendment rights. The Supreme Court agreed, saying that excluding religious schools from the policy is not only unconstitutional, but also hostile to religion. The three liberal justices dissented. Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote that the ruling dismantles the wall of separation between church and state. The Supreme Court decision will likely have implications on a national level. Currently, 37 states ban the direct or indirect use of taxpayer money in religious schools. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Coming up, a jury finds actor Bill Cosby liable for sexually assaulting a woman in 1975 when she was a teenager. And Twitter's board of directors unanimously recommends that shareholders approve of Elon Musk's acquisition of the social media platform. We'll have all that and more for you right here on NTD Daybreak. A California jury on Tuesday found comedian Bill Cosby was liable for sexually assaulting a woman at the Playboy Mansion in 1975 when she was a teenager. The jury awarded Judy Huth $500,000 in damages for emotional distress that the woman said that she suffered years later. Huth testified that the comedian invited her and a friend to the Playboy Mansion and sexually assaulted her when she was 16 and he was 37. Cosby, who did not appear in person at the trial, denied the allegation. Cosby, who is now 84, is best known for his role as the husband and father in the 1980s television comedy series The Cosby Show. His family-friendly reputation was shattered after more than 50 women accused him of sexual assault over nearly five decades. Next, much to the shock of many Twitter users, Twitter's board of directors endorsed Elon Musk's offer to buy the social media company. The board unanimously recommended shareholders vote in favor to approve Musk's $44 billion bid to buy the company. The Twitter board determined that Musk's acquisition of Twitter is advisable and in the interest of stockholders. Musk, however, stated there are several unresolved matters that need to be taken care of before the deal can be finalized specifically debt financing for the deal and resolving the dispute with Twitter over the total percentage of spam and fake accounts on the platform. Uh, you've, you've probably read about the, the question as to whether the number of uh, fake and spam users on the system is less than 5% as Twitter claims, um, which I think is probably not most people's experience uh, on when using Twitter. During a chat with Bloomberg Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite at the Qatar Economic Forum on Tuesday, Musk also addressed the issue of Tesla layoffs. We grew a little too fast in some areas, 
and so it requires a reduction in the salaried workforce. And we're about two thirds uh, hourly and one third salary. So I guess technically a 10% reduction in the salaried workforce is only roughly a three, three and a half percent reduction in total headcount. Musk added he is confident that a year from now, Tesla's headcount will be higher in both salary and staff. Cost MNS, NTD News. The mayor of Philadelphia, Jim Kenney, expressed shock and sorrow over the killing of a Filipino lawyer who was shot in the city over the weekend. He is offering a $20,000 reward for information that will lead to the arrest of the shooter. John Albert Lalo and his mother were heading to the airport to board a flight early Saturday when someone in a nearby car fired several rounds into their Uber at a red light near the University of Pennsylvania. That's according to police. Lalo was hit in the back of the head and died Sunday in a hospital. Police suspect it is most likely a case of mistaken identity. They examine the footage of vehicles, including a black Cadillac. Kenny said he was appalled by the senseless shooting and called for anyone with information to contact the police. Terrifying. The Food and Drug Administration on Tuesday announced plans to change the rules bringing down nicotine to non-addictive levels. That would be in line with President Biden's pledge to reduce cancer deaths by 50% over 25 years. Close to half a million Americans die every year from causes attributed to smoking. It could take the Food and, Ad and Drug Administration at least a year to implement it. And then experts say tobacco companies would likely sue to keep the rule from going into place. Coming up, meet the 20-month-old boy who is brightening up Instagram and bringing a smile to people's faces with his hair that's uncombable. In real life, Mark Zuckerberg is not known for being fashionable, but now the CEO of Meta is modeling designer clothes you can buy to dress your avatar. Mark Zuckerberg wants you to spend real money on high-end designers. All right, perfect. To dress not you, but your avatar. And to sell the idea, he and his VP of fashion showed his avatar decked out in everything from Balenciaga motocross to a prada shorts ensemble i think that, that looks cool to a tom brown cropped suit with stripes if i were wearing a suit i think that looks pretty sweet that's a big if as someone noted digital outfits from the guy with one outfit check out zuck's actual closet with identical t-shirts and hoodies can you imagine him in this? Classic kind of like English schoolboy kind of vibe. Or wearing low-rise jeans on a night out. Maybe a good night of computer programming. His newly fashionable avatar was dubbed Zuckatar. Tweeted one critic, spend money to put clothes on your avatar in this economy? No matter how self-deprecating Zuckerberg was. I mean, I think the only question is, am I cool enough to wear that? Twitter let him have it. Zuck, yuck. Playing dress up with your avatar reminded some of the good old days. Avatars as digital dollies. The high-end outfits will range from $2.99 to $8.99. But with his talk of wearing terry cloth, Zuck blew his fashionista credentials. Am I, am I making you cry on the inside and outside? He's a guy who's landed on several worst-dressed lists, but maybe his virtual self will make it onto the list of best-dressed avatars. And now, the story of, or my personal favorite story of the day, a 20-month-old boy has a rare hair condition that makes his hair stand up and uncombable. He's definitely turning a lot of heads, so let's see more. Bye-bye. This is Lachlan. He has the look of a rock star and is from a hair condition called uncombable hair syndrome. Turns out Lachlan is one in 100 who has this extremely rare hair condition. But another name is actually called spun glass hair, which a lot of the parents in the uncombable hair world prefer that. Can we touch his hair? That's like the number one question we get. People want to know how it feels. It's incredibly soft. So. He was born with black, straight hair, just like his older brother, and his newborn hair fell out, and his new hair started coming in around six months old. 
Um, and we just thought it was like this cute little peach fuzz, thought it might be curly. When, <laughs> when we first got his diagnosis or found out it might be what he had, Instagram was the first place I went to looking for information and for answers. So I wanted to be a source of information for other parents who might end up in the same boat. My husband came up with the Instagram name, Uncombable Locks with his hair, or with his name being Lachlan. We, the best messages we get and the best comments we get are um, people that are like, my day was gloomy until I saw lock on my feed or I check Lachlan's Instagram to bring me a smile. And the fact that he has the power to turn someone's day around or you know bring somebody a smile with the way the world is now, um, being not even two years old and having that impact, I think is pretty special. The only comments that really I don't like are the ones that just say like to cut it off or um, I'm so sorry he has hair like that because we're not sorry about it at all. We love it and embrace it. Um, we want him to embrace it as well uh, as he gets older. So. Just our biggest thing is em embrace what makes you, you and don't try to be anybody else. Um, that's, that's what we want to teach our kids. That's what we, what we want to teach Locke and um, just to remember to lead with kindness. However, there isn't a cure for the condition, although it may grow out during puberty. Say have a good day. But for now, they just let it grow up. That was really adorable. It sure brought me a smile. Yeah, me too. Truly the look of a rock star. You know, it turns out that uncombable hair syndrome is a genetic hair condition, like mentioned, where the shape of the hair shaft is altered, so the hair sticks out from the scalp and can't be combed flat. It's neither painful nor dangerous. It just looks very cute. And you know, Evelyn, I actually had hair a similar color as his when I was really young. Really? Yep, with baby pictures to prove it. Okay, so when will we see those baby pictures that prove that. Well, maybe tomorrow. Stay tuned. Okay, promise? Here, get it on record. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so don't forget to catch us tomorrow morning with baby pictures of Kevin Hogan. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.